This brings us to the concept of fair market value. What we've looked at so far is means of technical valuation of the project. The technical value does not necessarily reflect what is observed in the market. As defined in the Valmin Code, the amount of money for which a project will change hands between a willing buyer and a willing seller in an arm's length transaction, assuming that each party acts knowledgeably. And that's really the case. It's important to note that net present value does not represent fair market value. Net present value alone is simply a technical val value. This needs to be modified subjectively by the valuer's consideration of what is observed in the surrounding market. Fair market value represents the value of a hypothetical transaction. The buyer and the seller are therefore conceptual entities. Both parties have symmetrical information. information. This is never the case. Fair market value also assumes that neither the buyer nor the seller are under any compulsion to partake in the transaction. And there are no special conditions that would cause one buyer to pay a premium or a discount to the fair market value. This is very rarely the case. Because external factors that affect the asset value, overall market conditions, commodity prices, currency exchange rates and significantly political risk. All of these are unknowns that cannot be uh, accurately forecast but need to be incorporated into the valuation. As a professional mining engineer and geologist, one aspect that is very subjective uh, that absolutely informs evaluation is the credentials of the management team. Poor management can destroy a very good mining project and this needs to be recognised. It's a completely subjective judgement on the part of the valuer but it's one that must be made and incorporated into the final valuation. It's useful to look at the manner in which commodities are priced. In a typical commodity cost curve, of production, cost of production per unit of metal in the ground against the population of operators and the number of mines globally. There is a certain population that has a negative uh, cost of production. These are the cases where a commodity is produced as a byproduct. For example, copper being produced as a byproduct of nickel mining. The first tier of the cost curve are the low cost operators. Typically these mines are owned by multinationals, the larger mining companies, they're very low risk, they have low energy costs and they are large high grade operations. Most mines sit on the second tier, the medium cost operators, fairly new mines, fairly average economics um, that supply uh, a significant proportion, but perhaps not the bulk, of the globe's uh, commodity requirements. Then there's the third tier, the high cost operators. These may not necessarily be bad mines, but typically they are fairly small, fairly high grade and are reactive operations that will open uh, when commodity prices are high and close when commodity prices are low. The cost of uh, the spot price of any commodity at any point of time is therefore the median cost of production for that commodity on this cost curve plus a margin typically of around 10 to 15 percent. At the moment iron ore is trading at around about $50 a tonne I know for a fact that the median cost of a production for iron ore for producers around the world is in the order of $40 per tonne. So the current iron ore price is no surprise to me. If there's no infrastructure for a bulk commodity, uh, then the project has very little value. Uh, we're seeing this very much in Western Australia with the junior iron ore projects there. Uh, the cost of building railways in Australia is actually uh, relatively cheap uh, compared, believe it or not, compared to uh, 
some uh, international jurisdictions I've seen. However, the fact is that a lot of these projects have to build 400 kilometres worth of railway or make arrangements with existing um, railway owners. These existing railway owners typically uh, paid for their railways 40 years ago and are very reluctant uh, to let competitors use that infrastructure or if they do, at an extremely unattractive rate. So therefore these projects uh, that do not have uh, access to infrastructure for their bulk commodities uh, attract very little value and it's simply not economic to truck this stuff vast distances. The same goes for any other commodity. Um, some of the phosphate projects I've seen in Africa suffer from the similar, pro similar problems. Uh, there's no port, there's no infrastructure, uh, there is phosphate there, but the cost of uh, transporting that material to the market is prohibitive. The valuation of um, what I call uh, these new, co new commodities, uh, and uh, it struck me that we are possibly seeing uh, the wide-scale introduction of uh, new raw materials on a scale that hasn't been since, seen since the Bronze Age when people discovered the value of iron, uh, copper and zinc. Uh, we're now introducing uh, these new commodities for technological purposes. The value of these things is um, inappropriate in my view to ascribe in a dollars per unit dollars per tonne, dollars per pound uh, of these commodities because what the producer is, um, um, is, is uh, extracting is a product for a specific customer. So therefore the valuation of these projects is very much dependent on offtake agreements that have been arranged between the producer and the customer. It is extremely difficult and inappropriate in my view to simply ascribe a value to a uh, percent graphite or uh, percent rare earths for any of these projects because the markets for those individual elements are simply not known or there is no market for those individual elements. It's the combination or elements of elements or the particular product, the particular concentrate that has the value uh, and this is what must be valued in this situation. In relation to gold projects, uh, the peculiar attribute of gold is that it is effectively partially a currency rather than a commodity. So it's a readily saleable uh, product. Uh, the market for it is considered to be limitless. Uh, the price is fairly volatile for a number of reasons, uh, but you effectively have a, uh, an unlimited market for it. Now recognising that geologists and, and mining engineers, uh, well geologists, estimate their resources at three levels of confidence, inferred, indicated or measured. Typically as a valuer I will discount each of these classifications um, according to what I see and the confidence that I as an experienced professional will have in somebody else's estimate. Typically for an inferred resource I'll apply something like, not always, but I'll apply something like a 60% discount. For an indicated resource, I'll apply something like a 40% discount. For a measured resource, maybe 10, 15% discount. It varies according to what I think, uh, as an experienced professional, uh, the competent person has done and the amount of confidence that I have in that competent person. If it's somebody who I know uh, and uh, have respect for their abilities, I won't apply too much of a discount. But if it's somebody who I can see or have concerns about the manner in which they've estimated those resources, I'll apply significant discounts. 